Oh, again, this little bit of a different sort of a sermon this morning. Um, preaching on the, uh, the hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic. And of course, it was supposed to be last week, but obviously we had things shut down because of the water problem. But I'm going to give it a go here this week and um, give you a little bit of background information first. And, and hopefully as I make my way through it, you understand you know, why I'm preaching about this, this hymn that we, we'll end up closing with then today as well. But it was written by Julia Ward Howe who was a very committed anti-slavery activist. And um, she wrote the words to the Battle Hymn of the Republic early, very early in the Civil War. She had personally observed an encampment of un Union soldiers near Was Washington, D.C. Um, actually, the Confederate forces early, and if you're not a Civil War buff or you don't know much about it, early in the war, uh, Confederate forces were threatening Washington, D.C., and they, they were having a lot of successes. It was the, the low point in, in the, the Civil War for the Union Army. And, uh, and so she and I believe her husband and another, another pastor um, were, were walking in the area, I guess, in a, in a hill above where there were 60,000 sold, Union soldiers encamped. And she was, she was uh, walk, walking above the, that, that area of encampment and saw their campfires and so forth. And there's some more background to the story I, I won't share with you. But um, before, the, before dawn the next morning, she went to bed that night. And before dawn, she woke up and she had these words and phrases kind of running, running through her mind. And she continued to lay there in bed and actually thought through... Uh, for the most part, the stanzas of this hymn, Battle Hymn of the Republic, as she laid there, and I think her, her testimony has said something about, she figured, I better get up and write this down. So she actually got out of bed and, and wrote, wrote th these verses uh, down that became, eventually became then the, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, many in the anti-slavery movement, including Julia Ward Howe, believed that God's judgment was about to come on America because of uh, the, the wrongs of slavery. President Lincoln shared that, that feeling. And um, some of what President Lincoln had to say is now actually uh, part of it is, is uh, etched on the Lincoln Memorial. And he spoke these words during his second inaugural address in 1865, just days before he was assassinated. Quote, All knew that this slavery interest was somehow the cause of the war. Yet if God will it that the Civil War continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until and this war would continue until every drop of blood drawn with the lash on the back of a slave be paid by another drop of blood drawn with a sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so shall must it be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. End quote. Uh, President Lincoln had quoted Psalm 19 relative to the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. And Revelation 19.2 also says true and righteous are the judgments of the Lord. And so in any, any case, Mrs. Howe wrote her poem based upon her personal belief that God was going to use the Union Army to defeat the Confederate Army and, and use the Union Army as, basically, God used the Union Army as His instruments of judgment against the Confederacy for their continued support of slavery and their actually fighting to maintain the, the, the uh, use of, of slavery in the United States. And Mrs. Howell used various biblical references to the wrath and judgment of God against wickedness and against unrepentant people as the basis then for her poetic descriptions in this hymn. Then, when she wrote, and still today, there are greatly varying opinions about what Mrs. Howe wrote, these words to this song. Some people have declared and still declare that the words to the hymn are actually blasphemous in saying that God supported either side of the war. Some have declared and still declare that it is a horribly wrong application of Scripture, Scriptures that were written about specific judgments of God and, and specific people and nations, and certainly not 
not the civil war in America. And then some have believed and still believe that there's nothing wrong with the idea that God would support a, a war against a cause as unjust as slavery, nor that there was anything wrong with poetic use and application to the civil war of scriptures pertaining to God's judgment in other circumstances. For the most part, I'm not going to get into those arguments today, really at all. I think the reality that is that most people aren't even really aware um, of those arguments and only have a minimum, you know, a minimal amount of understanding about what the song is even about. We, you know, we sing it, we've sung it through the years, but I find that a lot of people don't really understand or know too much about what the words actually mean. The Battle Hymn of the Republic has been a beloved song for a long time and has been used in, in a lot of different settings. It's generally considered to be a patriotic song, but I'm not sure many people really understand why that is. And it has a military feel. Obviously, it's called the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And in verse 5, it calls for willingness to, for, for people to die in order to make men free. And, and that's actually been changed in most hymnals, including ours, and I'll talk about that when I get to it. It's often played, this song is often played and sung at patriotic events and on patriotic holidays like Memorial Day and the 4th of July and maybe Veterans Day and so forth. And of course, that's when I had it scheduled to, to be done last week. And, and in, in my 17 and a half years here, the times that we've sung it, it has always been those kinds of days. What, what, why, it, why is that? Well, it's just because, well, that's when we sing songs like that, right? It's kind of like a... a it's just we understand it to be like a patriotic song, but I, I wonder how many people could explain why. You know, why is it a patriotic song? Why do we sing it at patriotic events? So, so on and so forth. It, it has been in um, Christian hymnals actually pretty much ever since it's been written, but usually with some changes, and I'll, and I'll talk about that some. Um, basically, as I've said a thousand times, I, you know, you know I, I love music, and as much as I love music, what's the most important thing? The words, the, the lyrics, what, what we sing, especially relative to spiritual songs, Christian songs, worship songs. I, I love music, but the most important thing is the words. And what the words of a song say actually, um, you know, is my main, uh, my first point this morning. Uh, you know, what the words of this song say is one of my two primary purposes this morning in, in this sermon. And we'll take a look at those words shortly. My second main point, again, basically two main points. The second one this morning is whether or not you believe that Mrs. Howe used the biblical references correctly, you cannot get around the fact that the Bible speaks of God's wrath and God's judgment a lot. The Bible clearly says God has poured out His wrath on various peoples and various nations in the past and that one day He will pour out His wrath on the wicked people who will still be on the earth then and also ultimately pour out His wrath on all the wicked people of all the ages of mankind going clear back, of course, to Cain. And that will all happen in a final climactic series of judgments of God in the, at, at the end of his dealings with mankind. That, that, and this is all from, the, all from the Bible. And I've certainly pre preached from various books of the Bible that, that talk about this stuff. I also believe that the, Bible has, uh, that the Bible indicates that God has executed and still executes His wrath and judgment against people and against nations at times in the days since the Bible was completed in 90 A.D. In other words, I, th I think God has... has still uh, exercised His wrath and judgment against individuals and nations in the, beyond what is described in our Bibles. You know, since then and still even today at times, God exercises judgment on people and even on nations. For example, Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 4 tells us that governing authorities are established by God and that they serve as His agents of wrath to bring punishment on wrongdoers. And I believe that if God used heathen rulers and heathen nations like Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, if He used those kinds of, of evil nations to execute His judgment, which the Bible tells us He did, then why would we think that God wouldn't have used 
rulers and nations similarly since the Bible was completed and still even yet today. God does not let unrepentant sinfulness and evil go unpunished indefinitely. Yes, He allows it to go unpunished for a period of time, and sometimes we get kind of cranky about that, right? Sometimes we can't understand, God, why aren't you doing something about this? But the Bible is clear that He will not allow that to go on uncorrected indefinitely. Eventually, He will address it. And I will talk about that a little bit more in my conclusion. So first, Mrs. Howe, and I want to tell you, she, Mrs. Mrs. Howe knew the Bible. And her tie-ins, when I studied through what she actually wrote, and her tie-ins to Scripture, this lady knew the Bible. And she originally wrote six verses, or stanzas, of this poem in November of 1861. However, when her writing was published in February of 1862, so just a number of months after she wrote it, it was published, her sixth stanza was not published. And I actually, in my research, found only a few references to it. It's hard to even find much about it because it was never published, the sixth verse that she wrote. Also, again, in most hymnals, Mrs. Howe's third stanza is not included. Now, I'm going to go over it. Um, but it's not in most hymnals, including ours. And I'll explain why when we get to it. So that would leave four verses out of the six that she originally wrote. But our hymnal has five verses. Well, that fifth verse, if you even look in, the, in our hymnal, was written by modern composer Don Moen. Um, he's, he's actually still alive today. He, he, his verse says something good, but I personally don't think it really fix, fits the context from which Mrs. Howe wrote. And again, I'll talk about that when we get to it. So I'm going to actually go over seven verses today of, of, of this, one of which was written by Don Moen, and two of which don't appear in hymnals because one wasn't even published, and the other one, most people don't think it's... They, they, don't, they don't like what it says and don't think it's a, a good thing of, of the poetic illustration she used, but you'll, you'll, see when, you'll see when we get to it. So verse 1... Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is what? Trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of His terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, His truth is marching on. Well, first of all, this verse pictures a Jesus that's not very popular with many church-going people today. And that sounds like a kind of a weird thing to say. But yeah, there are different versions of Jesus that that church going people have. And I'm here to tell you that what I hear from people, their version of Jesus does not line up with the Bible. Their version of Jesus is not the biblical Jesus. And this is one way that this verse is talk this coming of the Lord is the coming of who? Jesus. And this trampling out the grapes of wrath and loosening the, the fateful lightning of a terrible swift sword and this, all this talk about judgment associated with Jesus. A lot of church going people don't like this stuff. Associating Jesus with judging and wrath and holy vengeance. But although that description of Jesus isn't popular, it's part of the actual biblical description of Jesus. Not the Jesus that people have produced in their minds. Not the Jesus that many people want. But we need to accept the biblical Jesus and all of what the Bible says about Him. We cannot make Jesus who we want Him to be. And I, I run across, in just everyday life and in my ministry, I run across a lot of people who want to make Jesus who they want Him to be and actually have made Jesus in their minds who they want Him to be. And that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Because people can claim to believe, if they claim to believe in a Jesus that is not the biblical Jesus, there's a real danger about whether they're actually even saved. Because some of them believe some really off things about the Lord. Jesus is who the Bible really says He is, and part of that reality is that God the Son, Messiah, Jesus, 
has been appointed by the Father to judge. And He will do so with divine and justified wrath. Let me read you some verses here. Revelation 14, 18 through 20, it talks about an angel who had charge of the fire coming to the altar of God and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle. Gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the wine press outside the city. And the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 180 miles. And that's a vision of a future judgment that has not, it's actually a vision of Armageddon. Similarly, Revelation 19, 15, which speaks of Jesus' second coming. Out of His, Jesus' mouth, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And He will rule them with an iron scepter. And He, Jesus, treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Joel 3, 12 through 13 says, Let the nations be roused, for I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. That's the people's wickedness. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And the Holy Spirit led the prophet Isaiah to write it as a conversation, actually, between him, the prophet Isaiah, and the future Messiah. Who is this coming? Who is this coming with his garments stained crimson? Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? And then the Messiah responding in, in this prophetic writing. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Well, the prophet says, why are your garments red? Like those of one treading the winepress. And the Messiah answered, I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger. I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and stained all my clothing. For the day of the vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave me support. So my own arm worked salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger, and in my wrath I made them drunk, and poured their blood on the ground. And lastly, in Isaiah chapter 66, Verses 15 and 16 says, See, the Lord is coming with fire. His and His chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down His anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with His sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people and many will be slain by the Lord. Many will be slain by the Lord. Folks, all, all these kinds of scriptures are wrapped up in the imagery that, that Mrs. Howe used in writing the words to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And as she envisioned, again, God using as an arm of His judgment the Union Army against the Confederacy. And I need to tell you, you need, we need to be, be very, very sure that we develop our theology, listen to me, that we develop our theology from a proper understanding of the Bible. Not that we develop understanding of the Bible from our preconceived theology. You need to follow that line of reasoning. We develop theology from understanding the Bible. We don't already have our theology in mind and then explain the Bible based on the theology that we already have in mind. That is, again, a very dangerous thing to do and something a lot of Christians go wrong on. So again, Mrs. Ward wrote about her belief that the Union troops were executing divine judgment against the Confederacy, poetically using the images of the trampling of grapes and the sword of the Lord that's used in the Bible. And she believed that God's truth was marching on in this cause. Verse 2. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. Now, I'm just going to pause real quickly. What do you think that was about? What, what, I, what did I describe earlier? 
What did she see? The, the 60,000 tro Union troops encamped there in the vicinity of Washington, D.C. to defend D.C. From the, from the Confederacy. She said, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. And I'll talk some more about that. What, seen him in the watchfires. What's that about? They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. You know these words. We've sung them, right? But we never think about what do they actually mean. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His day is marching on. Here, Mrs. Howe symbolically described the campfires of the Union soldiers, and she described those fires as representing Jesus among the troops. She was, as she saw those fires of the camp, she was picturing Jesus being in their midst. Now again, agree, disagree, whatever, this is the, this is the imagery she was using because of the cause of trying to eliminate slavery. And each fire, then, she saw as an altar to God. Just as the Israelites would build altars to God and then burn sacrifices to God on those altars prior to going into battle. And she, again, knew her scripture. And so she saw in these campfires as being an altar to God as, as the Union soldiers prepared to defend Washington, D.C. against the advancing Confederate army. This is how I looked upon the campfires of those 60,000 Union soldiers and envisioned these troops as the army of Jesus Christ, being used by Him to bring about the judgment of God to crush the evil of slavery. And she described reading from the Bible about the righteous judgment of God by a dim, flickering oil lamp, which she would have had to have read by back in those days. And so that, that verse in the song, I can read His righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps, she was talking about that, that righteous sentence. She was reading about the judgment of God in the Bible by an oil lamp. That's what she was describing. She believed that His day, God's day of judgment, was marching on. Verse 3. And I'll just tell you ahead of time, this is the one that you're not going to see in our hymnal or probably many hymnals. And I'll explain why. Maybe you'll get it as soon as we read the first verse. But I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my contemners or my mockers, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero, born of woman, crush the serpent with his heel. Since God is marching on glory, glory hallelujah, since God is marching on. So I think the primary reason that you don't find this in hymnals is Mrs. Howe's poetic use or reference to the fiery gospel expressed in the guns of the Union troops. That's what the uh, fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. She was referring to the, the arms, the rifles and bayonets and so forth of, of the Union soldiers. And that has, uh, that has taken many... Many a, a, a Christian aback over the years, and especially those who would come from, uh, you know, more uh, of the pietist, you know, not, not engaging in warfare people and stuff like that, of which, of which we, we are descended from as, as, as brethren and, and, and so forth. But for, for that one line, for that, for that line, this, this verse has not been included in I've never seen it in a hymnal. Maybe it's in some still that are out there, but I've never seen this verse in a hymnal. It's a shame because of the rest of the verse. It's pretty cool what the rest of the verse says. But again, she referred to this fiery gospel expressed in the guns of the Union troops. She saw the Word of God and the carrying out of His judgments against those who supported slavery in the steel of the guns of the Union forces. And it was as though she heard God saying to the Union soldiers, I will give you my grace as you act as my warriors against those who scorn and mock me. Referring to the Confederacy. Now, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not you know, proposing to you that I'm for or against you know, some, some of her 
opinions about some of this. I'm, I'm trying to teach you what, what the song means and what her meaning was when she wrote it and what it's about because we sing these words and we don't know that. And, uh, you know, and I, I think there's some, some things on, on both sides of, of the arguments, you know, maybe for and against these words. She said, and I believe, or I, I believe when she cried out for the hero, that who, who was the hero she was referring to? Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel. Christ, Christ. Jesus Christ. What scripture verse was she referring to? Oh, that's a little tougher. Huh? Come on now. Genesis, Genesis what? Huh? Yeah, I heard a, th I heard a couple threes. And what verse? 15. That's right, 15. Genesis 3.15 is a verse we all ought to know. Because that's the verse that talks that, that God said so long ago when, when Adam and Eve had fallen into sin and He was pronouncing judgments and He was saying to the serpent, pronouncing judgment on the serpent who was representative of Satan and saying, you know, her offspring... You're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And he was referring to the Messiah who would one day come, who of course turned out to be none other than God Himself in human flesh, God the Son, who was born and named as God's angel commanded Jesus. And so when, when Mrs. Howell says she cried out for the hero, Jesus, born of Mary, to crush Satan with with his heel, she was referring to that biblical fact that Satan actually works behind the scenes in the spiritual realm for the good, you know, for the for the support of causes of evil. And, and that that is taught in Scripture. That yes, human beings are evil enough on our own, but Satan is working in the spiritual shadows and he is trying to advance the cause of evil. And that's what she's, she's kind of referring to here, that that battle was also going on, that spiritual battle. And so she called upon Jesus to, to fight in the spiritual realm as the troops felt, uh, as the troops fought in the, in, the, in the physical realm. She's kind of calling on Jesus to crush Satan's heel, or, or crush Satan's head with his heel, while the Union forces are actually doing the physical battling, she's calling on Jesus to, to be at war in the spiritual realm against Satan, who she envisioned would have been supporting the Confederate cause and their support of slavery. That, that, that's what this is all about. Again, agree, disagree, or whatever, the, the woman knew her Bible. And she knew, she knew a lot of theology and so forth. You've got to really give her, give her credit for that. And so Mrs. Howe called for this because she believed that God is always marching on. Verse 4, He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before His judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer Him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, our God is marching on. God uses the blast of the trumpet uh, as a symbol throughout His Word. Numbers 10, verse 9, um, he instructed the Israelites, when you go into battle in your own land um, against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets, and then you will remember, be remembered by the Lord your God and be rescued from your enemies. 1 Thessalonians, it says that the trumpet call of God will summon believers, both dead and alive, from the earth to the heavens in, in what we call the rapture. And the angelic trumpets in the book of Revelation announce God's judgments. Mrs. Howe likened the biblical imagery of the trumpet to the divine call that she saw in the Union troops fight against slavery and against the Confederacy that fought to support it. She envisioned a fight without retreat as God judged the hearts of people and brought about justice. Be quick and eager to respond in obedience to God. Be joyful in service to Him, she urged and especially in this battle against slavery, it was a battle call, for God was marching on. Verse 5, In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born, what? Across the sea with a glory in His bosom that transfigures you and me. As He died to make men holy... And I'm going to read it the way she originally wrote it. Let us die to make men free. Our hymnals have something different in there, and I'll talk about it in a bit. While God is marching on. As I said earlier, 
Um, <clears throat> again, this, this, this imagery, she painted a vivid picture. That I, if nobody else, I never realized a lot of this stuff. And she painted such a vivid picture with her descriptions. Again, whether, whether you believe all of it or not, that, that she painted quite a picture with this stuff. Jesus was born across the ocean where? Huh? Gee, I mean, Christmas. Surely we know where Jesus was born. Are you guys dead? Let's go. We're going to have to stand up or something. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Across the ocean from America, right? So that's she's talking about when it says, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. Christ was born in Bethlehem. She's writing about stuff in America, even though it was America in the 1860s, and she's saying he was born across the sea. You get, get me all frothed up here. And, and through His glory, we can become new creatures, right? That's what she's writing about. We can become children of God instead of the children of Satan we are without faith in Jesus. And she urged those supporting the cause of the union to imitate Jesus Christ. That as He died on the cross, why did He die on the cross? To, to save us, to pay the penalty for, for our sins, to free us from sin, right? So, as Jesus did that, so she urged, the, especially the troops and other resistors of slavery and so forth, to, to fight even unto death to free the slaves. As Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin, make available His holiness and righteousness to us, and to free us from sin, so too she called upon, especially those troops, that if necessary, to die to make the slaves free. And that, that line is why so, so often the song has a military connotation because military folks have used it for years because of going out to fight in, in battles for the cause of freedom. Let us die to make men free. That, that's why it's been such a strong military song. But the, again, it's been changed in our hymnal and many other hymnals because um, a lot of Christians don't like that military connotation and so forth. And, and, and it's changed to uh, let us live to make men free. Meaning, let us live our lives seeking to lead people to Jesus so that they can be freed from sin. Now, that's good that we should be doing that. But I'm just not a fan. Uh, you know, that's not what the song was about. And I don't personally think that there's anything wrong with, again, going out to actually give your life, die fighting for the cause of making people free. But I, mean, I promised I wasn't going to get into that, so shut up, shut up, shut up. Now I'm off, off script. I've got to figure out even where I am here. Uh, okay, I yeah, talked about that. I'll skip that. Um, and, and the other thing is, I will say also that still today, even Christians, you know, yeah, we should live. We should live our lives to, to help make people free by leading them to Jesus and telling them about Jesus and living Jesus in front of them. But guess what? There are Christians in a lot of parts of the world today that physically die for Jesus. That, that because they live for Jesus and try to lead people to, to Jesus in areas of the world that, that they are really, truly persecuted, people die for that. So you can sing these words, you know, let us die to make men free. There's Christians who actually die to, to, to lead people to Jesus so that they can be free from their sin. So Mrs. Howe was saying again, let us be willing to even die for the divine cause of abolishing slavery while God is marching on. Verse 6. And most of you, unless you ever researched this hymn or something, you've never heard these words before. Because these are the words that were never published. When it went to the publisher, for whatever reason, they weren't published. He is coming like the glory. This is the last verse that she wrote. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave. He is wisdom to the mighty. He is comfort to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool and the soul of wrong his slave. Meaning the, the souls of people who are in the wrong, the unrighteous, the unbelieving and so forth will be Jesus' slave. 
Our God is marching on. So this verse refers, of course, to the time when Jesus will return to the earth, His second coming. He will be a, a source of wisdom for the mighty ones, of comfort to the brave ones. Those who, who uh, again, the reference to the, to the situation that she was writing about, she was, she was writing that He would, he would you know, be a source of strength and comfort to the soldiers, including those who would die for the cause against slavery. And then, he had, of course, Jesus' second coming it deals with His millennial kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Um, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 says, Jesus will rule with power and His enemies will be subdued under His feet as His footstool, as His slaves. As the Scriptures predict actually in many places that her words about Jesus coming back and the whole world being under His footstool and His enemies under, under his, uh, being His footstool. Psalm 110, Mark 12, Acts 2, 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians 1, Hebrews 1, 2, and 10. All those references, you'll, you'll find references about Jesus' enemies being put under His feet. And ultimately the Father will put all of Jesus' enemies under His feet in the end. They will be His footstool. That's what she was writing about. And she is again writing about it in the context of how those who oppose this righteous cause of eliminating slavery, they would be the enemies under Jesus' feet. And the brave who fought to eliminate slavery, they would be the ones who would be elevated with, with Jesus in this future kingdom on earth, the millennial kingdom. Jesus will come again and He will right the, right the wrongs. Essentially, she said, because our God is marching on. And then lastly, I'm trying to fly to a conclusion here, um, but don't get too excited because I've got a little ways to go yet. But the, verse 7, Dwayne already knew that. I didn't have to tell him anything. But again, as I said earlier, this verse 7 was not written by Mrs. Howe. It was written by Dawn Moen. And... Um, here, here's the verse. We can almost hear the trumpet sound. The Lord's return is near. There are still so many people lost. His message they must hear. Father, give us one more moment, one more day, just one more year. With God, we're marching on. So indeed, the, the trumpet call of God could come you know, at any time. It could be sounded at any time. All believers will be taken off of the earth in the rapture at that time. And one thing we won't be able to do in heaven is what? We won't be able to lead people to Jesus in heaven. Because you've got you to come to Jesus on earth to even get to heaven. There'll be no cause to lead people to Jesus in heaven. And so, um, Mo, Don Moen in his lyrics here pleads for the Lord to give us more time to tell other people about Jesus. More time to reach the many who are lost in their sins. Um, without question, it's obviously good. We should be burdened for the lost. We should have a heavy heart to try to reach people with the good news about Jesus and tell them about them and, and be used by God to, to lead them to Jesus. But I, ju I just don't think the verse fits the context of the song. Once you get into what the song's really, ab really about and everything, um, I, again, no biggie, but... Boy, I, I, this is as thoroughly as I've ever studied the song. I, I, I did a sermon some number of years ago on it, but not this in depth. Um, it, it just, that, that, Dawn Moon's verse doesn't really fit the, you know, the context. But again, I've talked a lot about my first point, which, is, which was actually understanding the words of the song. As, and you know, and what, what their intended meaning was. Certainly my second main point, the, the, the other point I wanted to make today, was that the Bible speaks a lot about what? God's wrath and His judgment. And obviously we've talked about that a good, good bit already just in, in the words of the song and the, and the scriptural background to them and so forth. I repeat that God does not let unrepentant sinfulness and evil go unpunished indefinitely. There is a price to pay eventually. God has already punished many wicked nations. The Bible tells us that. Various nations in the land of Canaan um, nations like Egypt, the powerful nations I mentioned earlier, like Assyria and Babylon and others, God eventually punished all of them. He eventually brought all of their kingdoms to a demise. And they were all eventually destroyed by other nations who operated unknowingly as agents of God. 
God also used some of those nations to bring judgment upon His own people. Who? Stay with me. Nation Israel. God used other nations to punish His own people, the nation Israel. God's Word predicted all those judgments and they all eventually happened because God indeed was marching on with His, with his plan. <clears throat> from from uh, Jeremiah 25, He spoke to Israel. He said... Um, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you people, the Jews, again and again, but you have not listened. And though the Lord has sent all His servants, the prophets, to you again and again, you have not listened, and you have not, you have not paid any attention. So the prophet said, Turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord, and you have provoked me. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and ruin. This country will become a desolate wasteland and I will serve the king of, and you will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Did that happen? Yes, dang well that happened. Israel was taken, Israel was decimated, and the people were exiled. Who, the ones that weren't killed were exiled to where? To Babylon for how long? 70 years. Imagine that, just what God said. <clears throat> he also spoke in Jeremiah to other nations. He said, he said to Jeremiah, Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And then it lists a whole bunch of nations back then. And then tell them, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, drink, get drunk, vomit, and fall, to rise no more because of the sword I will send among you. Again, using a nation in military action against a nation that God was bringing judgment against. God using that one nation to punish another nation. But if they refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink, in other words, if they refuse to listen to the message and heed it, Tell them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, you must drink it. You don't have a choice. See, I'm beginning to bring disaster on the city that bears my name. What's the city that bears God's name? Jerusalem. And will you then go unpunished? God was basically saying, what? You other nations, you, you think I'm going to punish my own people and you think I'm, I'm going to let you go? I'm not going to bring judgment and punishment against you? Not happening. He said, The Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from His holy dwelling and roar mightily against His land. He will shout like those who tread the grapes. And the Lord will bring charges against the nations and He will bring judgment and put the wicked to the sword, declares the Lord. The peaceful meadows will be laid waste because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Like a lion, He will leave His lair and their land will become desolate because of the sword of the oppressor, another a conquering nation, and because of the Lord's fierce anger. And it happened. It happened to a lot of those nations. All the nations that God said He was going to punish, they eventually fell. And at the end of Jeremiah 25, it talks about this future time of judgment. And when will be the great future? What do we call the great future time of judgment? The, the, the tribulation period? And Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, was actually writing some about picturing that day that still hasn't happened yet. Scripture makes it very clear that just as evil nations in the past faced the wrath and judgment of God, His wrath and judgment will also come on future nations, but worse than ever. And once again, His nation Israel will experience another devastating judgment, except that when that happens, a surviving remnant will, of Israel will finally do what? More specifically, they will finally accept their Messiah. You, you guys got to get this. You got to get this stuff. When, when God turns His attention to Israel again in the period of the tribulation, and whenever the Israel suffers wrath like they have never seen yet, remember they went through the Holocaust, 
But there will be this little remnant of Israel that will be saved, that will be preserved by God against even the Antichrist and Satan working through that Antichrist in the second three and a half years of the tribulation period from, from Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> and, and when that happens, when that little remnant of Israel is preserved through all the, the destruction of all the rest of Israel who was destroyed during that time, that little remnant will finally recognize Jesus as being their Messiah. As He has always been, of course. I'll skip. There's, there's a reference from Zephaniah chapter 1 that I had in here that talks about this stuff. Um, I'll say this. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Jesus Himself said of the future days of judgment, there, then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Jesus will appear in the sky, and all of the nations of the earth will mourn. In Revelation chapter 6, it says, then the, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everybody else, slave and free, They'll hide in caves and among rocks in the mountains and call out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the, on the throne and from the wrath of the, the Lamb. Again, how many people talk about the Lamb of God, Jesus? How many people talk about the wrath of the Lamb? Jesus is both Savior and also Judge. And the day will come when people will hide their faces and call on rocks to fall on them so that they don't have to face the wrath of the Lamb. At the end of that verse it says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Folks, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. As Abraham Lincoln quoted out of Scripture, and it's still that the judgments of the Lord God are true and righteous. His judgments have already rained down on peoples and nations of the earth throughout history. Sometime in the future, and, and, and I think with the rapidly escalating evil in the world, surely it has to be soon. Sometime in the future, the wrath of the Father and the wrath of the Son, Jesus, the Lamb, will be poured out on the peoples and nations of the earth. And this is no less of a truth than the precious truth of the salvation made available to us by Jesus dying on the cross. Just as true as that is, just as true as it is that He gave His life to die for us on the cross, it's just as true that there'll come a day where He will pour out the wrath of God upon this earth. And at the great white throne, Jesus will pass judgment on the unsaved people of all the ages and condemn them to where? In the lake of fire, to hell. Will you be spared from the righteous wrath of God? From the wrath of the Lamb? If this stuff should all happen today, are you going to be spared from it? You as an individual, each of us have to answer that question. There's only one way that you can be. What is it? You have to have placed true, saving faith in Jesus, given Him your life, asked for Him to forgive you, believe that He died, paid the penalty for you. If you've done that, you will escape the righteous wrath of God. If you have not, and you do not before you depart this earth in death, you will face the wrath of God. And the saddest part of it is you will face His wrath for the rest of all eternity. Have you done that? Have you placed true saving faith in Jesus? Be warned. God's day is marching on. And eventually it's going to come to that time where all these things that God has said in His Word will come to be. Where do you stand as God's day is marching on? We'll close and sing the battle hymn of the Republic as it's written in our hymnals there. 804, please stand as we sing.